When you want to lead someone, you have to find out exactly what they want, like truly what they want. Welcome back to another Rusty Move podcast. This is Chris today, and I have a special friend of mine. His name is Colin Lake, and Colin and I met many years ago. And when I first met Colin, I just loved this guy's energy. It was incredible. He had an amazing business. He was at RS Investments. I did a conference uh, for them out in San Francisco, I think it was the San Francisco area. But coming back, he calls me up and said, hey, I want to do more with our team. And so anyway, long story short, he brought his team to On Target Living three different times. And we did a couple day retreats. And... We had a great relationship. We had lots of fun. I think his team still today, many of them are different uh, businesses, but we still stay in touch. So it was a really uh, awesome three years in a row I uh, worked with him. And so Colin and I have stayed in touch for, for a long time. And we just got talking the other day and I thought, you know what, let's get this guy on. He's a high performer. Uh, he's a go-getter. He gets tons of energy. He has a great family. And um, so anyway, I'm going to lead into that and welcome my friend, Colin Lake. How are you, buddy? CJ, how are you? So thankful to be here and so happy to be spending more time with you. So kind of get the listeners, the viewers started a little bit about, you know, Tracy, the kids, and then let's dive into your business a little bit about kind of what separates, because you do lots of consulting and coaching uh, for business leaders. So that's really what I'm going to dive in today. But kind of let's start out a little bit about you and your family and where you're at today. Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, so I born and raised in Philadelphia. I started in, the, started in the financial services industry 25 years ago. I move up to Massachusetts and meet my wife, Tracy. Um, we get married and um, bring three lovely children into this world who are all currently teenagers today. Um, I have a bunch of, yeah, yeah, that's great. I have three teenagers and, and boy, do you need to rest, move and uh, sleep and (laughs) rest. I get it. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, so, um, so we're based in Massachusetts and happily married for 20 plus years and three wonderful children. And, um, as you said, I'm running a number of businesses currently and, um, you know, it, it requires lots of balance. And so that's why I've always been so grateful to have you in my life. So let's go back in time just a little bit. What, what, what were you doing approximately, you know, 10 years ago? And then what are you doing today? So what's interesting is we probably, I think we've known each other probably maybe 10 to 12 years ago. I walk into a conference and you're presenting and I was presenting after you and at this time, I'm the national sales manager for RS Investments. I started my career at the Hartford selling mutual funds and annuities to financial advisors. And so I, I then went over to RS Investments and was, head, you know, was heading up the, you know, the sales team there. So, so I was you know, at a big position, but, but nothing crazy. And I come in to do a presentation on our product or on one of our value-add resources. And you're up there presenting. I'm in there like getting myself ready or thinking I'm getting myself prepared. And I can't like do anything but lift my head up and pay attention to what you're saying. So because I'm so, you know, I've always been so interested in my health and my fitness and my ability to balance multiple different things. And um, so at 10 years ago, I am national sales manager for RS Investments. And that company gets bought. And I've always had this aspiration to help people who are leaving the military make a successful entrance into the financial services industry. All of the big companies are, are on this mission to take people who are ex-military and bring them into the financial services industry. I figured like I could wedge myself in there and train them really, really well so that once they get into the financial services industry, they could in fact be the next leaders of, of the financial services industry. That was, that was the mission. And so I started with this charitable mission and then started doing that and then taking these people who are well-trained and putting them in financial services industries. And it's a full charity. It's a 5013C. We take no money from anybody anywhere at any time. 
And a couple of companies said, well, you're training these people pretty well, would you consider training our people? And so then we, you know, the, I, love it. I, I love said, it. Yeah, and, yeah. And then eventually from a, you know, that, 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 that turned into a for-profit business. So we had to have the charity and then the for-profit business. Um, and then out of that comes a consulting business, um, which, which I have today. So, so I have the consulting business, which you referenced, I have the charity, and then I have the um, coaching and training and learning development business for sales teams. And so let's let's get into that. So again, you're kind of being a little bit humble here, but you were really crushing it when I first met you and you're still crushing it today. And again, you have lots of things going on in your life. But what are some common themes? Because you're getting a, you're really getting hired to really train future leaders and be the best they can be. So what are some of the common things you do? Because I've consulted with you about some of this stuff. So kind of walk the listeners in a little bit about what you th- what do you think are the, the the foundational pillars for when you're looking to get new talent, but also how do you raise that talent to a higher level? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to answer it just as you ask it, like new talent and move them into like management, like how, how do you help them get to there and then take management and ultimately help them be leaders. That, that, that is like the way we think about the world in which we work. Um, and again, that's financial services focus, but we work with companies like Staples and um, lots of Bitcoin companies, which I guess are, are our crypto companies, I should say, which are financial services related as well. But we work with a number of companies outside of the financial services industry, but we're heavily focused in that space. Um, <clears throat> okay, so like the first thing is in order to be really effective at your job, one of the things that we believe you need to do or need to think about or be prepared for is exactly who the client is that you're ultimately serving. And I think many times organizations try and train people on their software or on their product. And and, and those things don't have enough context to them. Like if, if, if we were just selling um, like cod liver oil because we thought the packaging was good or we had a really good logo and it had its health benefits, those things would be good in and of itself. But how it helps people do something is really what is what makes cod liver oil of, of use in this world. It, it does help people do something better and it keeps them away from things that they, that they don't want to do to be involved with, which is disease and, and other things. And so uh, one of the things we train on, one of the core things we train on, Chris, is like, how do you get someone when they join an organization to understand how the product impacts the end client? And then once they understand how it impacts the end client, then all of the product training lands, like it, it becomes palatable or understandable in a whole different way so that they can ultimately go out and, and, and be better at their job. So that's the first part. Like we're trying to help them understand who the client is and what the client wants and what the client needs and how to talk to the client, how to, how to like bring all this to the client in a way. And then all of a sudden when they train on the software, they say, oh, the software would help me do this. And so that, that's, that's that part. And then, so I'll take a breath there, Chris, but then the second part, which is like that gets them to be really good at their job. And a lot of times when people are really good at their job, they move them up into management or they make them managers so so i love what you're saying here because that's a universal if they understand who their client is and then they understand not only the labeling or the packaging or you know whatever benefits it but you're really taking it to the next level saying okay this is how this is going to change your life and this is gives you a sneak peek so as you said many times they get really good at that and then they're pushed into management. And I saw that in the health, you know, the fitness industry when I worked at a health club. If you were a really good trainer, well, you probably got to be a good manager. And that wasn't mm-hmm. always the case. So kind of to walk us through the next step. Yes. I mean, Chris, is, it, to the listening audience, we did not prepare that particular part. But it's like you, we prepared for that because what you just said sets up so well for what we see. Like they take people who are great at a job and then they put them in management. And then they wonder, meaning they is the people below them and people above them put them in that position, wonder why they become micromanagers. 
you've heard the term micromanager, right? For sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and the reason why, Chris, is because they're good at the job below them. They're good at the job. They're better than they're better than the people who are currently doing the job. That's why they were moved into management. You know what I mean? Like, so they're, they're managers. They're asked to manage people who are doing a job. They're going to show you how to do your job better because that's what they know. They've never had like management or better leadership training. Mm. And so like firms need to understand that like, okay, so the first step to being a good manager is you have to understand how to do your job really well. And, and that's good. And then once you, once you've trained on, on that part and you're really good at that, then how do you lead people to be managers in the future and leaders in the future? How do you get people into a place where they can be more than they currently are or think bigger than they currently have been? And so, so yeah, so like th- it's one of the things we work on is, you know, s- p- managers get get um, get challenged because they're micromanagers. And I say, how much how much leadership training have they been given? Well, we don't really do that yet. And then, of course, that, that's that's where we'll come in and, and work with the organizations. And so, OK, so you're good at this. Now, where do you want to be? Okay, so how do you how do you get there? Like how do you get there? Who's the client? Who are you trying to solve for? And then, and then we do that all over again. All right. So now I kind of feel like okay, I'm in there, but okay, all right, help me. I want to be a really good manager or whatever it is in our my world, but how do I come become a better leader? Better leader at home, better leader at work, better leader at church, better leader wherever. So whatever you're doing, how do you become a What's the what's some of the strategies and tactics that you teach for leadership? Hmm. You know, um, a great story. Do you, do you know Nick Saban, the head coach of Alabama football? Maybe not known personally, but do you, do you know the name? Yeah, actually, I played I played against Nick Saban, uh, my dad and I in a in a golf tournament uh, many years ago. He was Nick Saban was playing with Joel Ferguson, which is Joel was part of the uh, board of trustees. And so Nick was the head coach at Michigan State at that time. And we played in the tournament together. And it was funny that um, it kind of was a battle back and forth. My dad and Joel were about the same age. And then, you know, Nick's older than I am, but we had a really good match. We went into sudden death and um, they ended up beating us on the 20, I think it was the 21st hole. But I remember Nick coming up later in the tournament and people are always saying, well, Nick's not a very friendly guy. But he came up to me. I still remember this today. But he came up to me uh, during the, the the eating, the banquet part, and he said, "I got to tell you, that was one of the best golf matches I ever had." So anyway, that was my relationship with Nick Saban. Um, I've done some work with Mel Tucker. Mel Tucker was the grad assistant for Nick Saban. We did a podcast with Mel, and so um, I don't know Nick well, but uh, he was Michigan State's head football coach at one point, and that's my. That's my relationship with Nick Saban. So go ahead from there. I, I mm. digressed a little bit. So, boy, I, I sh- when I asked that question, I forgot about his Michigan State ties. I would have, I would have referenced that. But I, yeah, you, okay. of course, you know yeah. who he is. He's right? been, he's been, a, he's mm-hmm. been around though. So yeah, he was at Michigan State many years ago. Yeah, with you guys being in East Lansing area, of course you know him. Um, <clears throat> so he, he has, he has done something that so few human beings in this world have been able to do, and he's done it for a long time. He's been able to get 18 to 20 year old, 18 to 22 year old, 23 year old kids to be where they are, where they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to be there and do what they're supposed to do, what they're supposed to do when they're there. Like, that's amazing. And this guy, the evidence is always such a winner. He's done all these wonderful things, but that to me is, is the art of Nick Saban. And so I've, I've constantly like, reached out to him and, and studied him and researched him and try, I'm trying to learn as much as I can from him. W- one thing in particular, Chris, and this is now the answer to the question, is he says, when, when you want to lead someone, you have to find out exactly what they want, like truly what they want. I- I'll give you an example, Chris. Like, if, if I talk to a group of 25-year-old salespeople who are making $75,000 a year, and I said to them, how many of you in this room want to make $200,000 in a year? Every hand in the room would go up, right? Yes. For sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everyone's yeah. saying, yes, I want to make that. Um, but what they, what they are willing to do in order to go from 75000 to 200000 very few are willing to do. 
So what Nick Saban says is if you want to lead someone and you successfully lead someone, you have to find out what they really want and if they're willing to do what it takes to get what they want. That's, that's, that's step one. And then he says step two is your job then is to hold them accountable to the things that it takes in order to achieve that goal. So Chris, the answer to the question is, what do we do to, what, what do I, you're saying, like, how do I get people to, to be better leaders is I help them understand their people better. We give them a set of questions to work from and to operate from. We make sure that the answers to the question are legitimate and logical. And then we work with the once sales managers, now sales leaders, and help them lead people toward their ultimate goals or their, their higher successes. And that, to me, would, would be the definition of leadership. Well, I remember when we, um, the last time you guys came in with RS, uh, Tab hooked us up and we did a tour at the Michigan State basketball facility. And Tom Izzo, the head basketball coach, I think, I, I think most people know Tom Izzo. And uh, Tom was uh, gracious enough to spend some time with you guys. And I remember when when he when he came in and we went into the film room. We had the high back chairs. It was incredible. But Tom Man. didn't spend ten minutes with us. He spent ninety minutes with us. And I remember the story he told, which is just exactly what you're talking about with Nick Saban. But Tom would say, you know, I think one of the questions you guys raise is, how do you get these athletes to be motivated? And Tom said mm -hmm. exactly what you just said. He said, I want to know exactly what they want. And I sit down with them and I sit down with them one-on-one -on -one, and I look them in the eye and I want to know, do they want to graduate? Do they want to be first team all Big Ten? Do they want to go to the NBA? Whatever it might be, he'll, he, he asks those questions, he dives deep, and then he wants to reinforce that. And I remember him saying this over and over and over. He said, is that truly what you want? He gave them a bunch of outs. And they would say, nope, that's exactly what I want. And he said, do you want me to help you get there? And he said, it's not going to be easy. It might be challenging. I might not be the nicest person to you. And that's, he said, exactly right. I want you to help me get there. And then the last thing, Tom, remember him saying is he shook their hand. And that's what I want. And so when I hear people sometimes say that, you know, this coach or that coach is really rough on you. I think in the bottom line, and you see that with, with Tom, or you see that with, I know that with Mel Tucker, that these guys are really driving them hard. And again, it's a lot more, probably more intense than it is in corporate America, but they're trying to get you to where you want to be. And sometimes tough love is, is part of that. So I don't know if you remember that or not, but I, I, I remember that was like yesterday when you're talking about leadership that kind of brought that all back. Oh man, I was captivated. I remember exactly like the exact moment you just brought me back to it, like vividly remember it. And by the way, it's no surprise for those who don't know, Izzo and Saban are friendly, are very good friends. They're cut from the same cloth, you know, in, in many regards. So, so yeah, so no yeah, surprise. I think, uh, I think recently I remember because with Mel Tucker was on our podcast, you know, he always, you know, he knew and in, in, in Mel and Tom are really close and, and a big part of that introduction was through uh, Nick Saban because Nick and Tom are very, very close and they still are today. So, um, but I think when you think about leadership, I love that idea is like, okay, what do people really want? And I look at that sometimes in our space. So I'll kind of jump over in our space a little bit, but I, you know, I was working with a handful of people this morning and we started talking about goals and what, you know, what do you, and, and we kept getting into, and I kind of going into that path is, what do you really want? And then we go into, are you really willing to do this? And that's where you, that's where they're kind of like, I don't know if I'm really willing to do that or not. I might dabble in it, but what are you really willing to do? So I think that's the same conversation you're having, because when I remember where you were with RS, I mean, your team loved you. And I, you had the energy and you had all that stuff. But I think the big thing you were always doing was like, how can I help them get what they want? I think that was kind of your MO for a long time. And I still it today. So anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Is there anything else you want to add on leadership where you kind of dive into helping 
future leaders kind of lead better? Um, you know, one thing, and you just mentioned there with my team, like if I take, let, let's say um, over my years in the corporate world, which were 20 plus, um, two firms, it was about 13 at one and a little bit more than eight at the other. So 21, 21 plus years. Um, let's say I led, I, I led and worked with, I'm going to pick a number, 300 people over, over my career that I directly reported to me. Somewhere around the, the number, like 12% of them or so, I've tried to do this math before, don't have the most favorable opinion of me, Chris. They, don't, they, they think I was too rough. I rode them too hard. I pushed them too much. And so um, to your point, like, I think the great leaders like Saban and, and Izzo, like some of the people will say, here's what I want. I really want it. I really, really want it. And they say, okay, well, I'm going to hold you accountable to it. Then you hold them accountable to it. And they say, oh, you're too mean. You're too rough. You, you, you push too hard. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And so I, th I think, I think one of the great things or one of the things that great leaders do is that they're willing, like every, we're human beings. So we want to be like, and I want to be like, but I, I more want to help someone. I more want to help them get what they want. And, I, and I'm willing to like, not be like to, to push past that. And sometimes I think, you know, those great, the great leaders have to be willing to do that. So that's one of the other things we, we work with leaders on. Like, are you willing to not be like, because this is one of the things that'll drive you to not being liked by this person. If in fact they say this, they convince you that they're going to do this, but they don't actually do it. Yeah, it's not always easy when you're managing people because we, I think we all have that that human nature we want to be like. But at some point in time, I think I'm guilty of that. I'm like, you know, I'm not holding them accountable, or I, I, I'm doing something. I don't necessarily want the word accountability. I want them to be accountable, you know, to themselves. But sometimes I'm like, oh, it's okay, you know. But at the same time, I'm not letting I'm letting them off the mat that hey, this is really what you truly want. I'm going to help. And again, you know this when you go through some of those obstacles when they come out the other side they're so grateful i mean i know you've done many um physical challenges whether it's tough mutter or whatever it might be we don't like always being in that moment but boy when you're done that's pretty that's pretty amazing how how your body and your mind feels because you've pushed through that so a couple of things the other thing i want to ask you is for you yourself how do you stay at the top of your game what, what's your what's your strategy? What's Colin Lake's strategy to stay at the top of your game? How old are you today? What's what's your age today? I'm fifty. So you're fifty. So walk walk the listeners through what does because you are on the top of your game. I always look at me and this this cat's got some energy. Um, you know, he gets after it. He's got a great family. He's got a lot of stuff going on. A lot of balls. But he is on top of it from a performance standpoint. Um, and this is this is a a commercial for on target living. And I apologize to the listeners if you feel like this is a setup because it's not. But I met these guys ten or twelve years ago. I don't I don't know the exact year it was. I could easily figure it out. I just I just never have done that, Chris. But I could easily figure out what year that was when I first saw you speaking. It was at a Wells Fargo event. Um, but anyway, so. I always felt like at that time, like I was aware of how much I slept, but I kind of thought I was tough for sleeping less. Um, I was aware of <laughs> so yeah, like I used to sleeping think, less was a good thing. Yeah, like I, you know, I'm, I'm tough. I can operate on four hours of sleep and go still do all the work I need to be the parent I want to be and be an Iron Man. You know, I was doing Iron Man triathlons back then. Right. Still, yes. they still dabble in triathlons a little bit, but just not the Iron Man distance any longer. But like, um, like, you know, I, I was doing a lot of things there. I, I was eating healthy, but never really had a plan on how to eat to optimize. Um, I, I would, I would, you know, I, try, I, I, I like to have a beer or two. I like to have a, a drink or two, um, but I drank a little bit more back then. And then so as I, as I learned more about this through on target living specifically, now you're not the only input that I have in these things. Um, like I, I've recognized I have an ability to operate more effectively as a, a leader in, a, in my business, more effectively, and I, I should do these in, in order of importance for me, a better okay. leader in faith, a better leader with my family, a better leader in my business, a better leader with my training, and a better leader with my friends. 
And so like you're asking like, like, you know, like how have I been able to operate? I, you know, that's the way I think about it. First thing I say, okay, do I have my priorities in order? That's one. And then two, am I becoming, and I notice the tense of the word, am I becoming a better sleeper? Am I becoming a better eater or a better person at optimizing my nutrition? Um, and I be, and am I becoming a better um, mover? And, you know, am I am I moving more effectively? Am I am I moving more efficiently? And so I'm always thinking, like, am I sleeping at at my um, best today, and how do I do it better tomorrow? Am I eating at my best today, and how do I do it better tomorrow? And then am I moving at my best today, and how do I do it better tomorrow? And so, like, what what drives me, like, the, like the fuel I would suggest for all of that is this willingness to know that I'm doing my best today, but I'm only on a path to getting better tomorrow. And that that's the fuel for me. Like, I, I I'm, you know, I, I operate under this um, like philosophy or mantra of good, better, better, not good, better, best. So I feel like you know, if I'm you always trying to. Keep- yeah, you just want to keep getting better, keep sharpening the saw, raising the bar, just constantly want to get get better. Yes. And and that's the juice, Chris, for me. That's like the that is the they are the sources for me. So like you know, if I'm looking I'm looking behind you at the food wheel and I'm thinking like how do I minimize or eliminate the the reds for sure, the orange, oranges and like live more with an occasional yellow and the green and the, and the dark green in the center. Like how, how do I do that? I'm constantly thinking about that. For nutrition, I'm always moving toward being like an optimizer of the way I eat that allows me to optimize the way that I perform in business and in training and in, uh, with my wife, with my children. Let me ask you a question. So this is kind of a little off topic, but when you first brought your team in here, because again, you know, you brought your team in here. It wasn't just for like a two hour presentation. You brought them here for mm-hmm. a few days into the East, East Lansing, into our headquarters. But what were you expecting from your team? Because not everybody had the same passion um, for health and fitness as you did. But what was kind of the grumblings behind the scenes? on your way in here and then what were the some of the grumblings or maybe not so much grumblings hopefully there weren't on the way out so let's talk about that just for a second because there's a lot of people out there when we think about corporate america i mean the reason matt and i wrote capacity is that i think people will get to the health and fitness piece or wellness when it really lines up with the stars but we all know that's never going to happen so a lot of companies we you know try to we're not necessarily trying to convince anymore, but we're trying to help them understand that people are the greatest asset, and their health is the greatest asset of their people. So, so walk walk us through there because you really because you spent some cash to come here. So out of your budget, you thought this was valuable. What was what was the what was the thought that you or what you were hearing from your team, and then maybe a little bit about what they were talking about on the way back. Because you came back three years in a row. <laughs> right. They were that good. And we would have come back even more, but the company was bought. The only reason you sure, weren't there the right. next year is our company was bought. Um, all right. So, so that I, I love that question. I, I, I'm going to answer it two ways. First is the grumblings coming into it. So typically the events that we, that we do when we take like the leadership team or the top performers of, of a company, we do a trip and we do it somewhere – um, maybe exotic or um, somewhere in one of these islands or some Caribbean destination right. where it, it's so exciting. So it took a little while to convince people that East Lansing, Michigan um, <laughs> as in the fall was a good place to be to, to spend some time together. Um, so the first thing was the, the setting itself did not seem as um, inspiring. That, that's one. Two was, um, I, you know, th- these events that we usually do are, are less about um, getting better from a human perspective, but more from understanding product better or understanding an idea better or understanding a new change in the company's um, focus and those type things. And what was so unique about that event is w- we were able to blend all of that into one event. And it, it, I, think it's a, I think it's a good metaphor for life. Like everyone says, 
not everyone, a lot of people say it's hard to be a really good professional, a really good spouse, a really good father or mother, um, a, a really effective person at, at working out and training. Like it's hard to balance all those things. But when you bring a group of people together and you have like, how do I have them performing at an optimal level from a human perspective, from a professional perspective and understanding all, all of the direction the company has it. But it's one of the things you guys have mastered is here's how to organize an event so that all of those things are done seamlessly and like enthusiastically and comfortably and excitedly. Like we, we just all, we, we just all went in there w- with the exception of me, everyone went in there with this um, bit of skepticism. Everyone left with this idea of I can, like, I, I, I thought I was performing at my highest level. I can actually do more. I'm capable of more. There was more that I had to give without giving more energy or effort to it. Like I just wasn't using my energy and effort the right way. Right, and right. you helped us see that, like these events helped us see that. So the way they all walked out of it was like, almost like looking up into the left. You know how when you look up to the left, you're kind of like thinking like, oh, they, they seemed <laughs> like they were like that. They were real like pensive or like, wow, there is more in here than I've given myself credit for. And now I see how to tap into it. So in coming in skepticism leaving was like wow i do have more to give well in the in the in the cool thing for you guys you came back you know a couple of years in a row and we just kind of tweaked things and made it fun and like you said i think sometimes there's no reason you can't combine these components my daughter just got back from uh, seattle uh she's flying back sometime today but she was out there doing a conference and she was at this conference they'd never heard of us before she called me last night and she said dad this group was so excited because we were the first speaker that wasn't just you know product related it was a financial uh organization and then they wanted to have more like hey what can we do more with you guys and we've been we've been talking to them about this but until you kind of see it and expose yourself to it, mm. she said the food, I got to involve, I was involved in the food. We did a morning yoga class. I was one of the presenters, the list goes on. But that's, I just wanted to ask that question because I know your crowd wasn't always so excited, but then, and there were different levels obviously, which was great, but you combine some of your business stuff with some of our stuff. And I think we kind of mixed it all together. And I think people really felt like it was a very productive a couple days of uh, you know taking my myself to the next level, and then we threw some fun in there along the way. So I think you got to do that. We had to we had some fun activities along the way. So a couple sure. of things. Hey, before, Chris, before, go ahead. before you move, yeah, before you move off that, yeah, you said something that I think was really important, and I didn't touch on it. I didn't think about it until you just said it. If you remember, we had people at like maybe even opposite ends of the spectrum, people who were extraordinarily fit, focused, and interested to people who were the exact opposite end of the spectrum of that, like that was not a part of their life. And everyone walked out with, with three or four levels up personally, professionally, product wise, like we all left with a higher degree of um, optimism on, on what we can do with, with all of those, regardless of, of the scale, where they fell on the scale of, fit or not fit. Well, and I think one of the things we try to do that sometimes because people will say, you know, like, well, we got a group of our people that are probably not interested in this space. You know, that's personal. And I always go back and I'm like, no, those are people that are probably going to be the most engaged because now they're going to see that they could take another step and we're not trying to overwhelm them. And the people that are already doing the fitness stuff are probably going to continue, but we're going to help them. Like you, like a guy like you, I don't need you to work out more. I probably need you to rest more. So I'm going to try to sell you on why you need more sleep. And then the other person over here that's not doing anything, I'm going to talk to them about how that creates you know, emotional positivity by just moving your body for five to ten minutes. So I think that's the magic with groups sometimes. And sometimes the leaders don't really understand it until they actually experience it. like wow i didn't realize we did a group a large r- large organization a handful of years ago um and they came out going all right we need more of this but it was really hard to get in the door but once we got in the door you know they start realizing because the bottom line is we're talking today and this is why we have you on here but 
people are the greatest asset in any organization, but we got to step back, especially with COVID, that it's kind of waking us up that our health is our greatest asset. And we don't have it. We don't have a whole lot. So I want to, as we wrap this up, I got a couple more questions for you. How does Colin Lake stay motivated? What are some of the things um, you do to keep yourself motivated? I don't, you know, this, this is one that um, I think most will be able to relate to. Um, if you, if you had an Ironman or you had a marathon or you had a 10 K or even a 5 K road race that you were training for, like any version of those things, and you had it set out in the future, that is a good, um, like focus point to get you out of your house and get you moving and get you motivated. Um, so those things tend to inspire people. Once you put that on your calendar to do things and, and keep them motivated towards the things that'll get them to the place where they want to go. And so the answer to the question for me is how do I keep myself motivated is I always have something out there. I always have a, a, a goal that I'm after on the calendar I have short-term goals, longer-term goals, um, ones that require physical training, mental training, spiritual training. I'm always, I always have something out there, you know, whether it's a retreat for, you know, for my spirituality or I have a race. I just did the Spartan Beast um, up in Killington, Vermont, which was a beast. In fact, it, you know, anywhere from 13 <laughs> to 15 miles. And I ended up breaking two ribs, Chris, out there. <laughs> call you afterward and have you uh, help me have a I, I've been struggling mightily <laughs> I broke two ribs in the back of my my like left hand side of my body but anyway I broke them during the race um and you know but I always have something out there that I'm working toward it whether it's physical mental spiritual professional like, there's always something on the calendar that I'm working toward so it's constantly motivating me to take the steps I need to to get to that goal so uh, the short answer would be a goal I, I always have these goals out there and that's what keeps me motivated towards taking the steps in order to reach them. Well, and I think that's really critical. And those goals, sometimes I, I, I have these conversations with people and like, I'm not, not, I don't like to set goals. I'm like, well, all right, let's step back for a second. What do you want? So let's really, we can package it any way you want. But the bottom line is, is what is it? I'm trying to improve your glucose level. Am I trying to get a better night's sleep, whatever. So I like, I love, and this is again, what motivates me. I love to train for something. So I'm always trying to train for something, whether it's a perfect push up, can I do five pull-ups, whatever you are, whatever level you are, it really is nice to put something out there. Can you walk continuously for 10 minutes? I mean, I've had clients come in and I'm like, I can't do that mini trampoline for for a minute. I'm like, okay, that's going to be something we're going to work towards. And then they get there, and they're like, wow, I've really gotten better, haven't I? I said, yeah, because we put that out there, something to train for, and now you can actually see it. So I love that I'm right with you there. And again, for those listening out there, it doesn't have to be a, you know, the 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 tough mutter or whatever you the, was the one you just Spartan, in. the Spartan beast, yeah. The Spartan Beast, which again, Spartan took over for Tough Mudder, but um, I don't have to break a rib because the guy's an animal. So, but again, it's nice to train for something. So, as we wrap this up, is there anything you'd like to share with the listeners as we kind of wrap it up? Anything we're missing? One, one, this is going to be a shameless plug for you um, and for On Target Living. I, 10 years ago, started taking spirulina, Corella, um, and I started on the cod liver oil, and I started on the wheatgrass, and I have used it all along. Um, I certainly had periods where I've run out of stuff, um, sure. or, you know, so, so I've had periods like that, but I have been very consistent with that, and, you know, pe people will say to me who I train with or who I race with and who are younger than me. Um, and you know, they'll constantly say like, wh where does this come from? Like, where do you have this energy to do this? Or where do you have the desire to keep pushing? Or where do you have this extra gear to go a little bit faster at this time? And by the way, I am not, I'm not the fastest one. I don't win a lot of races and, um, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to s suggest that I do that, 
but I do have, I do have that, like, you know, people do say that to me from time to time. And so the one thing I, I don't think we touched on was that eating piece. And I, I don't know if it's a placebo effect or not. I don't think it is, but I do think my taking of those three things helps me a lot with my ability to think clearer than most. It helps me sleep better than most. Um, it helps me operate at the highest level on, on all parts of my life. So that'd be one other thing that, that I would add that I hadn't, we hadn't discussed to this point. Well, and I think the other thing too, again, we didn't talk about this before the podcast, but you know, the reason we came up with those, those are our big three, we call them, because they cover so much ground. If you looked at digestive health today, spirulina corella, wheatgrass, great for digestive health. Wheatgrass is low with minerals. It's high in chlorophyll. It's energizing, detoxifying. Cod liver is an omega-3 fat, vitamin D. The list goes on. But the point, I think, for most of us li listening today is you want to develop a, a habit and or habits that you can repeat and enjoy and they become very powerful part of your life. I can't imagine, you know, been doing this forever, getting up in the morning without my wheatgrass and my cod liver oil, and then during the day, taking the spirulina crawl. It's just a habit, but it wasn't a habit way back in the day. I started dabbling in this and dabbling with that, but then I found that when I put these all together, they become very powerful and keeping the body running at, 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 I think, at a peak level without putting a lot of emphasis and, and effort into us. So, but anyway, thanks for sharing that plug. That That's always a good mm -hmm. thing to hear from everybody. Mm -hmm. But I, as we wrap this up, I really, again, I, the reason I want to get you on the podcast is I think you help so many people. Your heart's always in the right spot. You're very energizing. Um, your performance level, you've been very humble today. Everywhere you go, you're very successful what you do. But there's some common themes that hopefully the listeners got today. And what I got is that is that you have a plan, you train for something, you you have a consistent ritual what you're doing, you have, I think, your priorities in the right shape. Everybody has their own priorities, but I think, you know, obviously your faith in your family is a big deal and everything rolls from that. So I think that's a, a big, and I think you really truly value your health. And I think when you put that all together, you're gonna see a high performing person. So. My friend, thank you for taking the time today. I know you're in uh, Virginia, you're traveling. So again, I appreciate that. You look amazing. Uh, as Matt said earlier, your suit is probably, um, you know, you just look like you're coming out of a magazine. We kind of look like bums compared to you. So thanks for taking thank the you. time today. And and hopefully we'll, uh, you and I will be talking soon. So again, say hi to Tracy and um, we'll see you down the road. Thanks again. Thank you for having me. Thanks everyone. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you next time.